Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Alexander Lidiak, and today I'm going to talk about the work my advisor Jeshuang Gong and I uh, recently have done using diffusion maps to learn quantum phase transitions in an unsupervised way. So this work can be found below at this archive number in more detail. There's um, a paper and we're trying to publish it um, in PRL as well. So we've done this work at the Colorado School of Mines in the Physics Department. Um, first off, we'll talk about the motivation. So we are currently in the NISC era of quantum simulators. And what that means is we're in the noisy intermediate scale quantum. So quantum implies that the measurement outcomes are exponentially growing um, in the Hilbert space and exponentially grow with the system size. So in the future, when I talk about measurement samples or sample data, um, I'm talking about classical bit strings that are essentially just the measurement outcomes of essentially measuring the state of a quantum simulator in our particular basis. So these results in the intermediate scale and the quantum aspect result in huge state spaces and these are very difficult to extract the physics of sometimes especially when there's no a priori understanding or the models are not simple enough to do this this is where unsupervised machine learning comes in so the reason it's very useful for this is because it automatically can extract um, features from large data sets and, and that's essentially what it is state of the art at. Not only that, um, dimensionality reduction can help assist in theoretical understanding because you can reduce the complexity of these very large state spaces and um, essentially boil them down into lower dimensional representations that you can further study and hopefully understand better than the large and complex um, data uh, state spaces, data sets in this large state spaces. Not only that, they are often um, robust to noise and can detect outliers. In particular, we'll focus on the bottom two though, feature extraction and dimensionality reduction. So first, let's talk about um, linear dimensionality reduction in one commonly used method, uh, principal component analysis or PCA. Essentially, it's this um, solving this eigenvalue equation it's the eigenvalue equation of the covariance of the data. Here, x is the data set, and it's just sets of these classical bit strings at different parameter values. So you organize these in descending eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And here is just an example. So here, your blue dots would be data sets or data points, and your uh, lines here are the first and second. I, um, highest eigenvalues. So essentially what the key principal component doubt, um, analysis does is it finds the directions of highest data variance. And these are the principal components and you can project the data onto these eigenvalues to try to remain as, uh, retain as much of the variance and in information as possible for a linear transformation. So for example, um, this is a 2D antiferromagnetic transverse field um, Ising model order parameter um, that is learned by PCA. And it's just the staggered magnetization. So um, blue and yellow are just opposite signs. So essentially it finds for this square lattice the um, staggered magnetization, which is of course the correct order parameter for the transverse field Ising model when it's antiferromagnetic. Um, so it learns this order parameter if and only if it's a linear combination of the measurement samples. So for more complicated models than the transverse field Ising model, in particular very complex systems in complex quantum matter that we don't um, understand a priori, it's often difficult for order parameters to be linear in the measurement samples. So examples of states in complex matter that are um, difficult to use linear um, order parameters on are topological valence bond states, um, many body localized states, um, and other such models. So 
we'll talk about nonlinear dimensionality reduction. In particular, we found that diffusion maps can be very versatile and useful. So the diffusion map is diffusion in sample space. So for example, if you have this data set here, um, you can do a lower dimensional parameterization onto the circle. And as you can see, this is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So it uses a nonlinear manifold to project onto. So to go into more detail on the diffusion process, um, you first define a transition probability that depends on a particular kernel. And here, this kernel just depends on the Euclidean distance squared, and it is a Gaussian kernel. And here, epsilon is a Gaussian envelope size, and L is your system size. So the leading eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this transition probability define the clusters um, of your measurement sample sets in your um, state space. And it reveals their connectivity and um, geometric features, essentially the um, underlying Riemannian, uh, Riemannian manifold of the data set. And you can define these um, leading eigenvalues and essentially the number of clusters you will focus on by defining a tolerance delta and by tuning this delta and the Gaussian parameter epsilon you can define the cluster sizes and essentially the features and physical features that the algorithm um, is sensitive to. So um, just to give a conceptual um, an underlying conceptualization of the features that are extracted at different regimes of epsilon and delta. So here we have, um, look over at the bottom right, it, we have epsilon is approximately equal to the number of spin flips that are different, or essentially the number of measurements of in a certain axis that differ from each other. So that's um, represented here by R over the um, number of um, qubits or um, uh, lattices, uh, sorry, lattice sites that you have times the ln of your tolerance um, to the negative one. So essentially this relationship tells you what regime of what value of epsilon for a given um, tolerance you need to have to be sensitive to the number of spin flips or differences R. So when you have only one difference, so this is the very, very left, when you only have um, essentially one difference, then you just find the number of unique samples. And I'm sorry, for consistency, I should have used um, L instead of N here. Um, but essentially when you only have one, you're privy to any single, di uh, any single difference of spin or measurement, then you have just your number of unique samples is reflected by the diffusion map. Then an intermediate values essentially between um, any single one and essentially half of them, which is, this is the average distance, um, the middle line, then you get a very different behavior for different phases. Um, and we explore this in more detail in our paper for um, particular models. And it, in particular, you can extract different phases, um, you, or you can tell that there are different phases in this intermediate um, epsilon regime. And they very much separate often. Um, so, and for an even larger value of epsilon, you can also often get the exact discrete symmetry group order. Um, which is quite an interesting feature. And this is essentially because these states are maximally separated. So at the top here, you can see kind of a qualitative representation of how this works. So you can think of these little blue circles as the Gaussian envelope. And whenever they are connected by overlap, um, you essentially have sets of clusters. So um, this is essentially also how a DB scan works, and this isn't exactly how the diffusion map works, but it's um, essentially 
a heuristic uh, representation. Um, and in general, uh, each region is focusing on different features or extracts different features from the measurement data. And combining the full, um, the full range of epsilon and exploring the epsilon dependence can elucidate different phases and phase transitions. So first we'll talk about um, essentially the simplest uh, phase transition. So we'll talk about the Z3 chiral clock model. The Hamiltonian is listed here and the parameters we tune are F and theta, um, as highlighted by the red boxes. Um, this is a Z3 symmetric version or generalization of the two, uh, Z2 transverse field Ising model. So most um, originally the entanglement entropy is the um, best way for acquiring the phase diagram. So here you can see we have a paramagnetic indicated by PM, a paramagnetic by FM, and incommensurate um, designated by IC, um, three different phases um, occurring here. So when you use um, entanglement entropy, you get this full phase diagram, but entanglement entropy is very difficult to obtain experimentally. Um, but when you use the diffusion map on just sample data, you also elucidate the full phase diagram, and you actually elucidate it um, or generate it far cleaner. Um, and interestingly, in this FM phase, uh, it's not shown here, but the very bottom value of the color um, bar here is actually three. So um, it also elucidates the Z3 symmetric um, phase, and that's the FM phase is Z3 uh, symmetric. It has a degeneracy um, of three. And it attains this full phase diagram, which is sample data, um, unlike the entanglement entropy, which is, is much more difficult to generate experimentally. And, and that was the number of clusters at intermediate M, at, um, or intermediate epsilon. So at higher epsilon, um, the diffusion map method using just sample data and um, looking at the number of clusters uh, will actually elucidate your discrete symmetry. And here it shows the Z3 symmetry, and we've confirmed this also with the transverse sealed Ising model, it's two, and then for a higher um, N generalizations, Zn generalizations of this model, it also um, highlights a uh, N symmetry, Zn symmetry. So um, it also essentially tells you or indicates that there's this symmetry present, and you can use other methods um, such as a Kramer statistic to, or a KS test to figure out um, exactly what kind of symmetry you have, which is quite cool. So another model that we explored, it's a little bit more complicated of a phase transition, is the uh, J1, J2 model. So this is a dimer model. It undergoes a, a valence bond like transition or a valence bond state uh, solid transition. Um, and here what we show, oh, sorry. Um, here we show the number of cl clusters and its dependence on epsilon. So this is the number of clusters that you get uh, from the diffusion map method. And essentially you feed in the samples and we generate these samples using exact diagonalization. So it's a classical, um, that's a big, large data set of classical bit strings that at different values of J2, here J1 is set to one. Um, and we feed this into the algorithm and we tune epsilon. And epsilon can be tuned um, after. It's essentially a very parallelizable post-processing. So you don't, wouldn't need to re-simulate the data or um, redo the experiment if you're an experimentalist. So here you can see the number of clusters versus epsilon. And the behavior is very different for the J2 equals 0 0.5 point, even compared to the 0 0.51 or 0 0.59. Um, 
and to elucidate this point um, even more, so sorry that that line should actually be at uh, 0 0.02, so it's shifted over a little bit. Um, but you can see essentially the difference here, um, even for um, J2 very near 0 0.5, you have very different behavior in terms of the number of clusters. So, so this is just a single slice at 0 0.02, epsilon equals 0 0.02. And here we actually highlight very strongly the symmetry breaking point at 0 0.5. So at 0 0.5, this model is exactly degenerate between the even and odd um, dimer states. Um, essentially, these are singlet dimers. And the model, uh, even though we're using exact diagonalization uh, with the Langsotz algorithm, it will still choose one of these two states to occupy. So it's, it's not perfect. Um, so, and it's not an e even superposition. So it actually detects, the diffusion map automatically detected this um, essentially symmetry breaking uh, occurrence. So this um, like cat state breaking. And um, it detects it very strongly. So in experiment, there's also going to be some noise and some symmetry breaking. So this is something that could be used to detect when symmetry breaking occurs using just um, experimentally gener uh, generatable measurement data and, and essentially classical bit strings. And not only that, it seems to indicate, so there's a drop there around 0 0.3 that might also indicate the valence bond solid transition um, and it becomes sharper as you increase your system size, uh, which is indicative of a um, thermodynamic limit uh, phase transition. So we also explore the diffusion map on many body localization phase transitions. So here is a, um, a heuristic or paradigmatic model um, used by, first introduced by Hughes. Um, here we explore the, again, the number of clusters in respect to epsilon dependence. So here you can see a very different behavior uh, for the very dark blue compared to um, essentially all of the other values of H. So H here is, is a random field um, that is added in the Z direction to essentially the Heisenberg model. And we've also done this with another model and um, Sim found similar uh, features. So, so here taking the blue and the red slices and looking at them in more detail. Uh, for the blue slice, this represents your number of unique samples. So at low H, you can see that it very quickly dips around um, 2.5 and shows that the system indeed becomes more and more localized. So the unique number of samples quickly um, quickly drops. And this, this is actually more, um, it's, it's um, indicative of the MBL phase transition because your samples become localized as disorder increases. So they become localized around your initial state. And, and here I should also mention, um, essentially these, uh, this number of clusters is generated from the time evolution of a Neal order state and it's time evolved by this Hamiltonian. So this is something that is uh, fairly uh, amenable to experimental um, realization. So you can um, essentially create these new ordered states, you can prepare them experimentally, and then let them evolve by some, some Hamiltonian, and then you can measure the uh, long time evolution of these states and that, um, classical measurement um, bit string you get out of that final simulation is essentially what we feed into the um, diffusion map algorithm and to generate these number of clusters. So um, if you also see here in the red curve, um, you can see, so this is at an intermediate epsilon, that the number of clusters actually peaks near the predicted phase transition. Um, 
And this is essentially the competition, or we believe this to be the competition between the ergodicity. So um, the phase transition occurs around uh, three, as predicted by Hughes, um, H equals three. And we believe this to be the competition between ergodicity and the increasing disorder with H. So um, you can imagine, essentially, you have these little mini clusters uh, because the ergodicity lets you explore the sample space some, but the increased um, disorder essentially sometimes localizes you around certain points in your time evolution, so um, from your initial state. So there's a competition between being able to explore the whole space and being localized. And the diffusion map pips, picks up on these essentially little mini clusters that form when there's a competing order of ergodicity and uh, disorder. And we also find this to be the case uh, with a different model um, that we explored that undergoes many body localization. And we believe that this could be very generalizable as well. So, and we've only explored these two models really. Um, so that's also pretty cool result. And so for more details, please see our paper on archive. Um, and in conclusion, these diffusion maps are a very versatile unsupervised nonlinear machine learning tool that are capable of detecting topological. So that was shown um, in the citation below. And discrete valence bond and many body localized phases, um, as well as their phase transitions, and can even detect essentially the discrete symmetry present in your system. And it elucidates, uh, just going back again to that, that takeaway and that uh, overview, it elucidates many different features, um, physical features in your data set. And at different epsilon, this is a very parallelizable. So um, once you have the data set, you can easily change epsilon and just rerun and uh, post-process the data. So that is a, another good feature about these uh, diffusion maps. And essentially, the hope is to be able to help accelerate and understand the physics of complex quantum si uh, simulators and quantum systems using unsupervised machine learning. And, and nonlinear machine learning is particularly helpful because it can help us understand um, it's more general in that uh, it can be linear and nonlinear, and it can help elucidate uh, physics and features of the system and reduce the dimension such that it's easier to understand. So this is a, a very useful tool that we hope to share with not only theor theorists, but also experimentalists. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd like to thank these individuals, and thank you.